Okay, Ken, thanks for talking to us. Um, can I first ask you, what, what got you interested in music? Got me interested in music. It goes back a long while during the war, actually. <laughs> World War II war. Um, my auntie and uh, uncle had uh, an old gramophone with a um, collection of records. Probably it was Harry Parry, the clarinetist, that really got me, and um, Artie Shaw got me interested in the clarinet, got interested in jazz, and um, I had some records by, um, uh, what's his name, Bob Crosby and the Bobcats, oh, yeah. all those sort of things, and uh, when they used to go out one evening, I used to creep in the, the bedroom, their bedroom, and uh, play these records, and I got really into it, and that's the first interest I've got into uh, jazz. So I, I would say I was about 10, 11, 12 years old, really? around that time, yeah. Yeah. And um, at the age of uh, 16, I bought a clarinet, an old Clinton system, Clinton system. And, uh, but <laughs> the guy who sold the old butcher up used to be in the Broadway. It wasn't a very good clarinet. It uh, only worked up the top of the instrument, not the bottom, but so I struggled with that and sort of packed it in. Yeah. Then I went into the Air Force, did my national service at 18, and um, with a lot of musicians, Spike Heatley, bass player with Dankworth, was um, one of the police, RAF police there, and a guy called Al Saxon, his name was Al, um, Alan Fowler, but he could become Al Saxon. He got actually, I think, second in the hit parade with a song called Jewel of the Tops in the 50s. Great pianist, he used to play the Naffy every night, of course, I got interested. And he said to me, he played uh, trumpet as well, he said, uh, if you learn the bugle, you get in the um, station band, you get extra 48 a month. So that's 48 hour leave a month. So within about uh, five, six weeks, he taught me how to play a bugle. So from there, I played in the station band, I used to play Revalley in the mornings, used to go to funerals and play the last post, the f used to play in the evening, play the flag up or the flag down, whatever. And um, there was a, a saxophone on the uh, in the band room there at the time, and uh, I got you got the use of it. And I had about three lessons with a guy in Oxford at that time. I was seventeen then. No, sorry, I was nineteen then, and uh, I had a few lessons, and I got really interested in it, and. Um, I used to put it under my bed, the saxophone. And then one weekend I came back from my 48, took the saxophone out and um, some Scotchman who got drunk over the weekend peed in it. No. Yeah, it actually peed in it and it was awful. So I had to return that back to uh, the camp. So I waited till I got out of the Air Force and I finished my apprenticeship at the age of 21 because I worked at the South End Standard. I finished apprenticeship as a photographic engraver. And um, instead of taking two weeks to go to my next job, I went straight to the next job and had my two weeks holiday money. I bought a boozy in Hawks from Hamilton's in South End, old Hamilton. And I started from there and had lessons. Um, had lessons from Kathy Stobart oh, nice. straight away mm. and I got into it at the age of 20 really when I come out of the Air Force right. and uh, the first jazz f club I had was at the old Victoria Hotel which is the old you know the Vic corner mm. there yeah and uh, the first group I had was um, Bill Iden drums uh, Al Saxon on piano, in the RAF of course, Spike Heatley bass and Kathy Stobart. That's the first live session I ever ran. Wow. So on a Friday night. And the next group I had two weeks later was probably one of the finest groups I've ever booked. One of my favourites was young, t very young Tubby Hayes then on, on sax and Jimmy Duca trumpet, because wow. I think probably one of the finest trumpet players ever come out of the British Isles, because he's Scottish, um, Jimmy Duke was. 
and um, I had Johnny Weed, who went to America on piano, um, Major Holly, the American bass player, and of course um, the greatest drummer, Phil Seaman. And that was a hell of a quintet. It should be packed. Yeah. And I ran, ran it there for a Friday night for a while till there was an awful fight one night and um, it sort of finished it off. But at that time, I, that's where I met Joe, the great Joe Harriet, who I've come very, very close friends with. Actually, I've got a book. The book's just come out the last few months of the life of Joe Harriet, and I've contributed quite a few pages to oh, it. Oh, right. Because yeah. we were great friends. Yeah. And at that time, I met a guy called um, Haig Joyce used to play under the name of Bill Haig because he worked for an insurance com company and they didn't really like to, an insurance guy to be associated with jazz. You got all this crap those yeah, years ago, you yeah. know. And he, he did like a drink. And he used to have a place over uh, in Eastwood, right at the end of this bungalow that's fields. And we used to um, have sessions there on a Friday night. We used to go from the club, get the young ladies, get the beer. Well, we used to get quarts of brown ale, Light ale, and the girls used to have Chianti and um, VP port, which was awful stuff. It wasn't. Haig used to have his own scotch, you know, tucked away, but in those days it was all sort of beer and mm. the cheaper sort of. Yeah. And we used to have parties all night there. Wow. And I mean, we've had some of the greatest musicians come there. But that's, you know, other stories. I mean, there's yeah. so many stories yeah. I can tell. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. Who can you remember seeing perform music first? The first one I ever saw live was um, Freddie Randall. The trumpet player Freddie Randall. That was because I was into trad with the guinea. All right. Um, that's when I was 17. Then Humphrey Littleton appeared at the old Middleton Hotel, which is a Bacchanalia, I think. Did he? become the Bacchanalia. Yeah. Now it's... Um, an Irish bar, isn't it? Mm. Yeah, opposite the station, South End Central Station. I saw Humphrey Littleton there with um, Wally Fawkes was on clarinet, uh, Keith Christie on trombone. Hell of a band that was. Mm. But um, when I went into the RAF, I I heard um, Jerry Mulligan do Knights of the Turntable, and also like Jules Shearing. That's I lo love that. I you heard those went, on records. Pardon? On records, you yes, heard those. Right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Completely changed from the traditional side into the modern, right. more modern side, and then sort of went went on from there. Yeah. Interest, you know. Yeah. So, what made you choose the saxophone as opposed to the clarinet? I, I, I don't know. I just love saxophones. I always did. You know, I love clarinets, but going into the modern side of it, mm. you know, I, I wasn't. Um, I didn't really get on great with a clarinet. I must admit. Right. Um, but after sort of starting on the uh, saxophone during my RAF days, I uh, much preferred it. Right. <coughs> yeah. So I went from there, you know, but um, I started very late. I mean, you get these kids now. I mean, you take Dick Morrissey at 20, he was out blowing and tubby, and they were brilliant players at that age, right. you know. Yeah. But listening to these guys got me more interested in it. Right. So when and where did you first perform in, in public as, as sort of a jazz gig? It was the Arlington Hall. Oh, right. It was the Arlington Hall with Norman Barron. Sorry, yeah, Norman Barron, the uh, trumpet player who's played with Basil Kirchin's orchestra. He lived down here and he formed a little quintet. And um, we did the interval up at the uh, Arlington one Sunday afternoon. Right. And I always remember that one because... I was so nervous, you know, <coughs> and uh, went went on from there really. But he, he, he was a great arranger, Norman, and we had a great little band around here, you mm. know. Mm. But then Norman left. He went to Hull, and um, I had a trumpet player called Terry Letman, who I've visited. In, he lives in Texas now, and I went to see him about five years ago, and stayed with him over there. Right. He was with me for a while. We did. Uh, Quintet, and then I met Vic Wood because um, Terry went to Australia, and uh, I met Vic, who was in the army at the time. Mm -hmm. I was about twenty four, twenty five then, and um, because of Terry leaving, I asked him if he would be interested. He said yes, 
So he brought along, he, he was good friends with Pat Green and Pete Holder mm. and um, we found Roy Weatherly. Yeah. So I formed, I, was, <laughs> I had all these great plumbing. Pete Holder was a great bass player and Pat Green to me is probably one of the finest drummers ever come out of this area. I mean, Joe Harriet really rated him, mm. you know, and a lot of the boys who played with him, Kathy, Don Rendall, I rated Pat. Mm.